Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is April Wepler. I am the Engagement Coordinator at the Canadian Environmental Law Association, or CELA. We're so glad that you're joining us for this webinar today. We are talking about a new toolkit that CELA has developed. It's part of our series of Making the Links toolkits, and this one is focused on southeastern Ontario. Um, I'll start off with a land acknowledgement. I'm in Guelph on the banks of the Speed River. Uh, which is traditional lands of Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee people, as well as treaty lands of Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and Six Nations of the Grand Watershed. Um, and I'll just also note that we're getting some pretty heavy rain here in Guelph. So if you can hear kind of a background pitter patter, it's uh, because I'm underneath a steel roof right here. So I apologize if there's background noise. So I'll tell you a little bit about CELA. CELA is a public interest law clinic dedicated to environmental equity, justice and health. Founded in 1970, CELA is one of the oldest advocates for environmental protection in the country. With funding from Legal Aid Ontario, CELA provides free legal services relating to environmental justice in Ontario, including representing qualifying low income and vulnerable or disadvantaged communities in litigation. And we also work on environmental legal education and law reform initiatives. On the line with me today are Rick Lindgren and Jacqueline Wilson, who are both lawyers at CELA. Sawyer Fobert, who is a law student with CELA, and Zoe St. Pierre, who is CELA's articling student. So a quick bit of housekeeping. I'm sure we're all familiar with Zoom webinar. Um, so we are in webinar mode, which means that your mics and your cameras are off, but I would encourage you to use the chat box. So you're welcome to introduce yourselves. You can share a land acknowledgement if you'd like, and you can ask any questions that you have at any time. Um, if we can, we'll reply in the chat um, mid presentation, but if not, we will have a time for a discussion and some questions and answers towards the end of the presentation. We are recording today's session. You would have heard that when you came in. We're going to record the presentation portion of the webinar. We will not be recording the discussion portion. So after the webinar today, you'll get an email from me with the PowerPoint decks. So you don't need to frantically write down any links. You'll get the slide decks and you'll also get a recording um, of the webinar. And those will both also be posted on our website. All right, so let's move into Sorry, Zoe, I totally forgot to have you advance slides um, while I was talking about CELA. So do you want to just go forward one slide so people can see the about CELA that should have been up while I was talking? Okay, so I've already covered all of this. And then next slide, please, Zoe. And I'll just mention the Canadian Environmental Law Foundation. For those who aren't familiar, this is the charitable arm of CELA, um, which also hosts um, our law archives and library and extensive collections of environmental information. Um, so I encourage you to check out that website. There's some great resources on there. And next slide. And then just the agenda for today. So first up, we're gonna hear from Sawyer, who's going to tell us about the Making the Links Toolkit. Uh, followed by Rick's presentation about public participation in environmental assessment and land use planning. And then we'll have a pause as I stop the recording and we'll move into the discussion portion of the presentation today. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to Sawyer. Thank you, April. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for being here. My name is Sawyer Faubert. I'm a second year JD candidate at Osgoode Hall Law School. And over the past seven months, I've been working with at CELA through the Osgoods Environmental Justice and Sustainability Clinic, which essentially places students in different, you know, legal aid offices to complete environmental and law work. So I'm pleased to present you CELA's latest Making the Links Toolkit for Environmental Action in Southeast Ontario. The toolkit contains information on how you can use the law to prevent environmental harm to you, to your community, and to your region. It includes useful tips on public engagement and an introduction to some available legal tools and further information to help you better understand the environmental landscape in the environmental law landscape in southeastern Ontario. Next slide, please. So before we get into the nitty-gritty, there's some important terms that we should go over that are really relevant to the environmental law context. The slide. Uh, so first, environmental health. Uh, what is environmental health? So environmental health is a branch of public health concerned with monitoring or mitigating factors in the environment that can affect human health and potentially cause illness or disease. Environmental health focuses on the relationships between people and their environment and addresses all of the physical, chemical, and biological factors external to a person and all related, related factors impacting behaviors. 
Some issues impacting environmental health include access to clean water, access to healthy food, exposure to toxins and carcinogens, you know, ensuring that our environment around us is safe and healthy. Federal, provincial, and municipal governments, as well as indigenous communities and indigenous governments, play a key role in regulating environmental health through their law and policy and decision making powers. Uh, slide. So that's environmental health, and let's move into environmental racism. Environmental racism refers to the disproportionate proximity and exposure of indigenous and racialized communities to polluting industries, dangerous projects, and other environmental hazards. It typically occurs when environmental practices and policies are intentionally or sometimes unintentionally resulting in the disproportionate negative impacts on certain marginalized communities including higher rates of cancer, reproductive diseases, illness, birth defects, and plenty of other health issues. The environmental racism was a term originally coined by Benjamin Chavez, and you can see on the slide is what it's described as. So a lack of political power, the you know, implementation of pol policy sanctioning the presence of life-threatening poisons and chemicals in a community, and a history of excluding racialized community from environmental decision-making processes, as well as decision-making bodies. So an example of environmental racism in Canada, one a really prominent one that comes to mind is Africville out East, where the government intentionally relocated the black community to dangerous industrial zones and had and the community was exposed to toxics, toxins and other uh, dangerous substances and air quality that affected their health. So that's a very prominent of environmental racism in Canada, although not in Ontario. Slide, please. So if environmental racism is the problem, which it is one of the problems, then we can turn to the term environmental justice as a, one of the solutions to addressing the racism. So what is environmental justice? It's a principle that environmental benefits and burdens should be equitably distributed among all persons rather than being discriminatory against marginalized communities. Environmental justice requires the elimination of environmental racism and also class-based ra uh, racism and is a proponent of indigenous self-determination to be involved in these decision-making processes and as part of the regulatory process uh, for zoning different environmental projects and such. Uh, slide please. So that covers environmental racism and a quick overview of environmental justice. So now we'll move into the right to know. So the right to know is a principle based upon human entitlement to information which directly impacts health and bodily integrity. A public right to know includes databases which, you know, identify different chemicals that are being, excuse me, which disclose different chemicals that are being used alongside their hazardous properties and why they're hazardous, what are their impacts, how do they impact environmental and human health. If you go into an employment situation or employment context, a right to know for an employee is knowing the hazards of the of the work they're doing and if they have an entitlement to reject that work if it's unsafe or threatens their bodily health, body of health or environmental health. So it's kind of the idea that you have the right to know what is going on around you and how it's going to impact you. So if a new project is being developed, the public in the community has the right to know how that's going to infect, affect their environmental health and human health. Slide. So now we're gonna move into a discussion of free prior and informed consent. So the term informed consent is not only used in the indigenous context, but it's also something that's used in the medical context, for example. Um, so the concept of FPIC, free prior and informed consent is similar to informed consent, but in the law context, uh, the free and prior is a specifically legal concept. It incorporates the inherent right of all Indigenous peoples worldwide and is detailed under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, essentially, which says that 
all indigenous people have the right to free for free prior and informed consent on a project. Slide, please. Uh, thank you. So what does FPIC entail? So free means that the consent is given voluntarily without coercion or manipulation. Prior means it's sought sufficiently in advance of the commencement of any proposed activity or project which requires Indigenous consultation. Informed is, means that the provision of the consent is timely and adequate and um, the community is informed of the project and its you know, potential harms or benefits before any decisions are made or any shovels are put into the ground. And then consent is, of course, the final decision made by the Indigenous rights holder according to their decision-making projects uh, as to whether or not they agree to have the project move forward. As per 2021, the free prior and informed consent of Indigenous, Indigenous communities is mandated through the adoption of the United Nations <laughs> Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act, which was passed by the legislature, which recognizes and upholds Indigenous rights in Canada and ensures that Indigenous people have meaningful participation in decision-making processes for projects that impact their rights, their communities, their health. While FPIC is typically spoken about in the Indigenous context, it also applies to racialized communities where projects are proposed which would treat their communities as some sort of dumping ground or uh, treat their communities as a means to get rid of contaminants and potentially harm the environment by doing so. So slide please. I know I went through that quickly. Those are just you know really broad overviews of important terms to be familiar with in the environmental law context, especially when discussing indigeneity and the rights of indigenous peoples in the province. So now I'm gonna move into a few case studies, which are just um, explored more in detail in the actual toolkit itself, which will be posted on the CELA website in the coming weeks. Uh, so a few, we're gonna start by going over um, a case study called Ecology Ottawa. So slide, thank you. So Ecology Ottawa is a nonprofit grassroots organization based in Ottawa, Ontario, which is comprised of Ottawa residents who are volunteers. So the mandate of Ecology Ottawa is to make Ottawa green. Uh, and they do this through community organization and entering into partnerships with different institutions in the city to help uh, achieve their mandate. And they, one of these tools has been monitoring any city council decisions that have been made regarding the environment and ensuring that you know, the community at large is aware of any of these decisions and are able to make comments to the city councillors and the mayor uh, to ensure that their voices are being heard. So, uh, slide please. So in 2021, um, which is already two years ago now, which is crazy, Ecology Ottawa released their Breathe Easy campaign report. So what is the Breathe Easy campaign? Essentially, the volunteers at Ecology Ottawa monitored air quality at 46 locations across the city to get a better understanding of the correlation between air pollution and air quality and different factors such as income or population density or different um, data markers as such. So what the re report ended up showing was that the air quality data when analyzed against socioeconomic demographics really show that air quality and air pollution is a lot worse in lower income neighborhoods. So more so than any of the other um, demographics, income was the main marker of air quality. So the lower the, in, the income in that neighborhood, the worse the air quality and air pollution is in that neighborhood. Slide, please. Um, so yes, I just went over the findings and the report also goes into some policy recommendations for the city to, you know, address this issue and ensure that uh, we can move forward in a more equitable way and in 
avoid that sort of environmental racism area that is being shown through this campaign. So the policy recommendations are as follows. Increase the granularity of air quality mon monitoring across neighborhoods in the city. So currently, the only official air monitoring location in Ottawa is done downtown, and there's not official monitoring through other areas of the city. So they're encouraging the city to implement more uh, testing locations. Secondly, to reevaluate zoning and bylaw routes with an environmental equity lens to ensure that truck routes and you know other means of producing air pollution are not concentrated amongst these low income neighborhoods. And then moving forward, there's you know the recommendation to increase affordable housing and increase affordable housing supply across the city to end the disproportionate impact of poor air quality on the lower income marginalized communities. If people can afford to live anywhere, then we wouldn't have such a high correlation between the neighborhood income and the air quality issues. And then finally, uh, the Ecology Ottawa recommends that the city explore expanding environmentally protected areas within the city to increase the beneficial impact of green space on air quality overall. And an example of that, what you can see in the report, if you, if you choose to go look at it, is that areas in the city of Ottawa with a lot of green space, such as um, at different farms, then the air quality in those areas are a lot better. So by increasing green space, that's also a means of improving air quality overall. Slide. So that's just before I move into this next case study. So if you are interested on reading more about the Ecology Ottawa campaign and the Breathe, Breathe Easy campaign, you can check out Ecology Ottawa's website and find the full report uh, to download and view there. So that's one case study of uh, air pollution in Ottawa. So we're going to move into a second case study uh, highlighting environmental issues in southeastern Ontario, which is the Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's Near Surface Disposal Facility, or an NSDF. So the Canadian Nuclear Laboratory's CNL applied for a license to build a near surface disposal facility at the Chalk River Laboratory site. So, uh, you know, CNL owns the CRL site, which is where they're uh, applying for a license to build the facility. So what is a near surface disposal facility? It's essentially an engineered mound, uh, which is mostly beneath the ground, but the proposed design in this location will have some aspects of the design above ground. And it's a place to store low level radioactive waste. So in the nuclear industry, there is three uh, overarching types of waste. So low level, medium level and high level waste. And this, this facility would only be for low level waste, which would be waste that's occurring at the CRL site uh, such as like, you know, safety gear, gowns, gloves, shoe covers, and all these materials that have been exposed to low levels of radiation, but that still need to be stored appropriately and safely. Slide. So in order to receive a license, uh, the CNL has to apply for the license and approvals through the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, which is the regulator of Canada's nuclear industry. And part of that application process requires the proponents, which in this case is CNL, to not only have meaningful public engagement opportunities, but there needs to be appropriate levels of Indigenous consultation. It's important to mention that the proposed site for the NSDF is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquins of Ontario. Uh, as of yet, there hasn't been a public decision made regarding the licensing of for the NSDF, but uh, that will be coming uh, hopefully in the near future. Slide, please. So when we, we were talking uh, briefly about FPIC and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and this conversation uh, is topical for this case study, because the United Nations 
the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people, UNDRIP uh, for short, states at Article 29, subsection 2, that states shall take effective measures to ensure that no storage or disposal of hazardous materials shall take place in the lands or territories of Indigenous people without their free, prior, and informed consent. And Canada, through the UNDRIP Act in 2021, recognizes the declaration and requires that the government of Canada, through consultation with Indigenous people, develop and implement UNDRIP in Canada. So we have this notion that, you know, UNDRIP calls for no disposal of hazardous materials without consent, FPIC consent, and then we have to implement the UNDRIP in Canada. So this all results, as well as, you know, Section 35 constitutional rights. Um, there's, all of this is to say is that when applying for a license, the, there's a duty to consult and accommodate Indigenous groups who are affected by the project. So the CNSC as a federal body has that duty. And as such, this duty arose in the application for the NSDF licensing slide. So the, one of the central issues that was really brought to light during these public hearings that were required is that some of the affected Indigenous nations felt that or expressed that there was a lack of adequate, adequate consultation. And because the proposed site is on the traditional territory of the Algonquins of Ontario, these, um, all of these communities have the right to have FPIC and to ensure that their free prior and informed consent is obtained before any project is approved, licensed, and underway. So in this instance, uh, two of the Algonquins of Ontario community, and I apologize for my inability to uh, properly pronounce their names, which is the Algonquins of Barrier Lake and AOPFN for short, uh, they both submitted in public documents, which you can see on the CNSC website, that the CNL did not engage with in meaningful consultation with them. And with further, not only did they not engage in consultation about the project, but this CNL and the CNSC did not seek FPIC. So there was no free, prior, or informed consent regarding these projects. And this was obviously a major concern raised by these nations whose rights treaty rights and inherent rights are going to be affected by the construction of the NSDF, which, you know, has some safety concern, environmental safety concerns, which I believe I go into in the next couple of slides. Slide, please, Zoe. Okay, so just before, uh, to backtrack a little bit, the environmental concerns really center around the proximity of the proposed location to the Ottawa River. So there's concern of contaminant uh, contaminants being leaked or traveling to the Ottawa River, affecting the water source for millions of people. And then, as I mentioned, the traditional territories uh, may suffer as a result of, you know, having a nuclear waste disposal facility uh, on the lands themselves. So at these CNSC public hearings, um, the Indigenous communities I mentioned raised their concerns, but there was many other intervener, interveners at the process, including SELA, who voiced other concerns um, outside of the duty to consult and consult and accommodate. If you wanna read more about how these public hearings went, you can look at SELA's uh, student blogs, which uh, kind of go over each day of the hearing and what went down and what was said. Uh, so that's a very interesting resource to have a better sense of what it's like to be at a public hearing for nuclear licensing. Slide. All right, so that wraps up the overview of the NSDF process that's going on outside of Ottawa, near the Pembroke area. And a lot of these conversations are centered around Ottawa just because that's the biggest city in Eastern Ontario, and there's a lot more um, different types of projects and concerns going around in Ottawa in and around the big city. So my final case study that I'm going to go over today is the Eastern Ontario Transportation Plan um, in relation to rural transportation uh, for folks. So 
Essentially, in 2022, uh, CELA released a report entitled Recommendations for Municipalities Focus, Transportation for Rural Communities. So the report, uh, excuse me. So the report features recommendations for the municipality to take into account when, excuse me, sorry, let me uh, backtrack a little bit. Sorry, the SEAL report is talking about how marginalized communities uh, in rural areas suffer from lack of access to transport to public transportation because they're cut off from essential services as they can't get there. There's no bus, there's no train. So they would need a car to get to, to schools, to hospitals, to grocery stores, to any essential service. And a, owning a car, as, as you may know, is quite expensive and not something that is feasible for many people. So it's really important to expand the public transportation infrastructure through to rural communities who are still part of cities to ensure that folks can access these you know, very important services and not be left behind. So with that in mind, um, and those recommendations in mind, we can analyze against the Eastern Ontario Transportation Plan, which was released in 2021. It is a draft plan, but it's the working policy for transportation right now in Eastern Ontario. So the plan um, is ambitious and it's really working to improve infrastructure, transportation infrastructure between cities and ensuring that there's more opportunity for uh, like tr train travel between cities and buses. So people are less car dependent, um, as we just talked about, that's a good thing. Um, but the issue that I see in the Eastern Ontario Transportation Plan is there's no recommendations to municipalities to ensure that their infrastructure projects and public transportation projects are uh, going to be helpful for those rural communities. There's no push to include everyone. And an interesting example is the city of Ottawa's tr transit system. And for the past two decades, but more recently in the past five years, there's been a big push to expand the city of Ottawa's transit system to reach more people uh, throughout the city. And uh, OC Transpo, who runs the transit in, in Ottawa, is very excited because uh, by the time all the trans the sorry all the infrastructure improvements have been put into place, uh, they're hopeful that over seventy five percent of Ottawa residents are within, uh, I believe it's two kilometers of transit. Now, on paper, that number is great, and it is great to be expanding the transit system, but there is no expansion into rural communities in the city. So folks living in areas such as Embrun and Russell, which are, are semi-rural or rural enough, still don't have access to any sort of transportation that would bring them to the city proper. So yes, it's great that transit's improving for people within the city, but we still have these uh, the remaining outstanding issues for people who are living rurally. Um, so I think that's my only slide on this. So, uh, you know, it would be great if municipalities took this approach to ensuring that everyone has access to transit and not just those who can afford or who want to be living in the city proper. So that's a little tidbit about the East Ontario Transportation Plan. Uh, slide, please. So these are uh, those are just some brief case studies about different issues going on in southeastern Ontario. Um, but now we're going to move into the question of what can you do about it? What can you do to change or be a part of these decision making processes which impact different groups of people? So we're going to go over some public action and public opportunities for engagement in the following slides. Slide, please. So one, we're going to start by talking about the Environmental Registry of Ontario, which, okay, so there's the Environmental Bill of Rights, which gives Ontario residents the right to have a say and to participate in environmental decision making processes. And the Environmental Registry of Ontario is the, a means through which 
this can take place. So the ERO has postings about permits, approvals, open consultation, like open and ongoing consultations of related to environmental projects within the province and uh, things of that nature. So the ERO is really an important website to see how you can get involved, which projects are going on, and to have a better sense of what the environmental impacts from those projects will be. So each posting on the ERO uh, contains information to the public um, and comment periods that you can engage with. So as some examples, uh, the Environmental Bill of Rights requires that the community that the public has the right to comment, uh, rights to re request an investigation of violation, right to request review of the law and policy. In some instances, there's a right to appeal a decision that's posted. And finally, it also, uh, the EBR requires the duty to consult. Slide, please. So navigating the ERO, that is a whole task in and of itself to understand how to view this, all the different information that the ERO has. Um, so once a proposal has been implemented, the ministry has to post a notice about that proposal on the registry, um, which will explain the effect, uh, if any, of public participation on the proposal. So how do you use the registry? Upon first visiting the site, you, you will automatically see all new postings in the general search tool, all instruments posted within the last seven days, or you can use the consultation using a map. So you can see those three buttons or the three pictures on the bottom of the slide. You can click either of those buttons um, or links to view the uh, correlating information. So you can customize your notification preferences and receive news on consultations that you want to follow from the ERO. So you would do that by clicking a notice and then following these instructions to have the follow the notice. So you're getting um, notifications when there's progress made or any changes on to the proposal. Slide. Um, so just to continue, uh, it's funny, when I was putting together this presentation, I had to go back and make sure I still remember how to use the registry because it is not the most straightforward thing. But once you hit cl click the search registry, you can enter keywords that, you know, so you can get postings for your area or whichever area you're interested in knowing about. So to do so, you put input your location or the region you're looking to learn information about. And the searches can be filtered by all these different factors to narrow down what kind of information or posting you're looking for specifically. So if once you get the slide deck, if you're interested in searching the registry, you can use these bullet points here at the bottom to narrow down uh, the information that your search is gonna give back to you. A slide, please. So the map is quite an interesting tool on the ERO because it posts, it has, you know, a point for each place where there's uh, proposals, reviews, or decisions going down. So the map allows you to search for notices, which are permits and approvals, and pins the approximate location on the map. So you can filter again by location. So if you were to input your city, maybe Belleville, it'll, the map will zoom into Belleville and show you exactly where the postings are. Slide. So you can sign up for uh, alerts from the uh, ERO. So you'll get email notifications, which is the same thing as I went over before. You just need to click the follow this notice button when you get to the posting on the ERO. Slide. So that's uh, the ERO Environmental Registry. And now we're gonna move into a different tool, which is the National Pollutant Release Inventory, NPRI. So the NPRI um, is a publicly accessible database of pollutants that are being re released into the environment or transferred for disposal. The NPRI is updated every year and is published online by Environmental and Climate Change Canada. And so when you're on the 
NPRI, you can search for different data either by using the tool or by clicking pollution and data reports on the main homepage. And you can, there's all different ways that you can search for the information you're looking for, including by the ID, which typically you might not have the actual ID that your number that you're looking for, but you can go company name, substance, industry type, etc. Slide. So what I did um, in my example, actually, so, Zoe, can you go to the next slide? Is when I clicked search, and you may be able to see in the screenshot, I clicked advanced search because I wanted to know all the postings related to Cornwall, Ontario. So I implemented Ontario as the province. And then once I inputted Ontario, then I could type in Cornwall. So then when you have the area you're looking for, you can hit search and you'll come up uh, and it'll come up with all of the different postings or permits in that area for releases of environmental contaminants. So here you can see the first result that comes back is BAS, BASF Canada. And if you click on that entry, you'll see what kind of substances that uh, company is emitting on the site and where that site is and different information kind of just about that company and what it's doing on that site in relation to the environment. So it's a really useful tool if you're curious to what kind of emissions are going on uh, where you live or in a region in which you're interested, uh, you can type it in and, and you'll get a full list of um, data. Slide. So that's the NPRI. Uh, so the ERO and the NPRI are just great tools to be aware of different environmental proposals and decisions and then emissions that are going on within uh, the province and within your jurisdiction. So now we're going to move into freedom of information requests and access to information requests, um, which when you're seeking information or data that isn't publicly available, you can still sometimes gain access to this information through submitting either a freedom of information request, an FOI, which is at the provincial and municipal level or by submitting an access to information request, a tip, which is at the federal level. So this is the process you'd go through to get uh, records, documents, information, as I mentioned, that you, it's not publicly available otherwise. So anyone can make, uh, you know, any citizen, permanent resident or corporation in Canada can make either an FOI or a tip request. So provincial FOIs uh, are governed by the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Municipal uh, requests are governed by the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, so FIPA and MFIPA. These uh, pieces of legislation are functionally identical. So if you read through FIPA and then you go and compare it to MFIPA, they're identical uh, for all intents and purposes. There may be some sections that um, are numbered differently, but typically the information is very similar in both those pieces of legislation. And um, federal access requests are governed by the Access to Information Act, a tip slide. So let's go through uh, provincial or municipal freedom of information requests. Now, when you read up on FOIs in the municipal context, it in theory is quite similar to the provincial um, steps to get one, but it is quite important that you go to the municipality's website and look to see if they have information pertaining to their freedom of information process because they may have specific um, requirements or fees associated with a request to that municipality. Uh, so it's very important to make sure you're adhering to that process. So for example, you can look up Kingston, Ontario, Freedom of Information, and there's a full website from the city of Kingston on how to submit a Freedom of Information request to this, that municipality. But overall, and definitely for provincial requests, you follow these four steps to submit your request, which is firstly, um, 
you need to determine what kind of record that you're looking for. And you would do so by looking through the online database of the directory of records. So that will tell you uh, the type of record you're looking for. So once you've determined what type of record you're looking for, you can go to the directory of institutions, which will then tell you which institution holds that record itself. So then once you've determined the first two steps, then you have enough information to complete and send in your official freedom of information request form, which you can submit online or via mail. And for more detailed, um, for a more detailed guide of the actual steps and ensuring that you can know how to navigate these different directories, you can consult the guide, the provincial guide to making an FOI request, which is linked in this slide. So you'll be able to click that once you get these slides. Um, and then with any FOI application, there's a mandatory $5 fee that goes along with um, your submission. And however, that $5 may not always be the end of your payment. It there could be additional costs associated with your request, depending on the type of information that you're seeking and the cost it would take the institution to get that information for you. Um, so it, it, there are typically other costs associated with um, an FOI request, but that's the overview of how to go about uh, submitting a freedom of information request in the provincial context. Slide. So when we go into the federal access to information request process, it's very, very similar. So first, uh, you know, the government asks that you look at the existing summaries, which is a database of information that's been publicly released as a result of different ATIP requests. So um, if you look to that summary, you might find what you're looking for without having to go through the ATIP um, uh, process. So go through that, then same idea, you go through the index of what's, which institution has the information you're looking for and then you fill out the request form and send it in along with a payment. Now at the federal level, the government's very much encouraging uh, folks to use the online database and, uh, oh, sorry, the online submission forum. So um, it is a lot easier to have an ATIP online account, which you just need an email uh, to complete and um, that will help facilitate submitting your application. Slide. Sawyer, I yes. just want to point out time if you can try and maybe whip through this last example so that we can move to Rick in the next two or three minutes. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry about that. So just okay. quickly, Thanks, um, we did already talk about the CNSC in the NSDF context. So we don't really need to go through this in, in depth, but essentially uh, there is requirement for public participation and you can participate by becoming an intervener. So members of the public or so organizations who have interest or expertise in the matter can become an intervener. And um, it depends on the hearing type of whether the submissions are gonna be written or oral or potentially both. So when submitting an intervention, you know, why is it important? What's the key issue and what are the facts? So those are the questions you wanna answer in your intervention slide. Um, yeah, and then just more information on the process, you're typically given only 10 minutes to address the commission and you cannot uh, cross examine other interveners or ask questions of either the proponent nor the CNS CNSC staff. Uh, they, the CNSC staff may ask questions to the intervener following their submission. But it's always great to speak up and ensure that your voice is being heard um, if you do have an interest in the issue at hand. So don't be afraid and participate in the process if you feel comfortable doing so and want to um, make a difference in the participation process slide. So quickly, the last slide, which you'll have when the slides are disseminated are just different maps and resources. So a lot of the things I went over you can click these links and it'll bring you directly there to see the map, to see the ERO, to see the NPRI. And uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry that I went over time there. 
that's totally okay, Sawyer. No, there's a lot of content in there. So that's completely understandable. Um, yeah, so I think Sawyer said this, but just to remind folks that we will send the slide decks out. So all of those links will be made available to you. Um, after Rick's presentation, we'll take a couple of minutes and just talk about kind of next steps for the toolkit and ways to get in touch with Sila um, if there is information that we can help you with. Um, but I will pass it over to Rick. Thanks, Sawyer. Oh, Rick, you're muted. So I am. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I just want to thank Sawyer for her presentation and thank you, April, for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to pick up where Sawyer left off. I'm going to provide a bit more detail on how and why members of the public can participate in the environmental approvals process. Um, I'll also provide some real life examples in southeastern Ontario. Uh, where public participation rights have been successfully used by some of my clients. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for over 50 years, SELA uh, has represented clients in the courts and uh, before tribunals throughout Ontario, uh, including Southeastern Ontario. Um, and I uh, have been at SELA myself for close to 40 years. Um, but I now tend to take on cases primarily in this region. I live in southeastern Ontario. Um, and I like to think of that as uh, being a good example of uh, thinking globally and acting lo locally. Um, and the common feature in many of my cases um, is the fact that they often involve uh, situations where public participation rights are available before environmental approvals are issued or amended. Uh, by government government officials. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> why do public participation rights matter? Um, why are they entrenched into various environmental laws? Well, I think this slide provides a good summary of the reason why we want to make sure there's good, meaningful public participation in the environmental approvals process. Um, the bottom line is that meaningful public participation uh, can result in you know, better, more credible, more protective, more accountable decisions in relation to environmental approvals or the types of terms and conditions that should be built into environmental approvals in order to uh, protect the environment, protect local communities, protect public health and safety. Um, next slide, please. So let me turn now to three Ontario laws that include important public participation rights. Um, the first is the Environmental Assessment Act or EA Act, as we like to call it. Um, as some of you may know, this law has undergone a number of uh, significant changes in recent years. Um, but so far, the individual EA process um, is more or less still intact. Uh, and that means if a proponent wants to build or construct or expand a large landfill, um, it has to go through the individual EA process. And on this slide, I provided the four main stages of that process, namely, you know, preparation of the terms of reference, the actual preparation of the EA documentation, the governmental review of that documentation once it gets submitted by the proponent, and then the final ministerial decision on whether or not the project should be approved or rejected. And at every one of those key stages, there are built-in opportunities uh, for public engagement. Um, I also note in the final uh, bullet point here that um, at the end of the process, when the matter has landed on the minister's desk for a decision, the minister does have power to refer the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal for a public hearing and a decision. Now, I should say that that re those kinds of referrals have not occurred very often or at all in recent years, but that power to refer a matter to the tribunal uh, still exists and is still available in appropriate cases. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the next law I want to mention is the Planning Act. And again, as some of you may know, the Planning Act sets out um, the municipal land use planning process and the appeal process uh, here in Ontario. Basically, if a landowner wants to change the current use of its property, then it's likely that an official plan amendment or a rezoning uh, bylaw is necessary for that change in land use to proceed. Um, if an application is made for an uh, official plan amendment or rezoning, that triggers public notice requirements under the Planning Act. Um, 
and a mandatory public meeting has to be held by uh, the municipality before it can um, grant or approve an official plan amendment or a zoning bylaw. Um, so if you see or if you receive a Planning Act notice uh, pertaining to a proposed land use uh, that may have be of concern to you, please be sure to submit comments to the municipality. Please be sure to attend and participate in the mandatory public meeting because that will help preserve your right to appeal the decision if necessary to the Ontario Land Tribunal. So don't miss that opportunity. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so the third and final statute that I wanted to mention is the Environmental Bill of Rights, or EBR. Um, I won't spend much time on this because Sawyer has already taken you through uh, some of the key components of the EBR. Um, I'll just say that um, I was lucky enough to be on the government task force that drafted the Environmental Bill of Rights back in the 1990s. And in my view, I would say the most important part of the EBR is, the, uh, is part two of the legislation that creates a, a mandatory public notice and comment regime for environmentally significant instruments. Instruments is just simply a, a broad term that cat captures you know, licenses and permits and approvals that are required under environmental statutes here in Ontario. Um, so there's a regulation under the EBR that prescribes which types of uh, instruments are subject to notice and comment under the EBR. Um, and if a, if a proponent needs one of those uh, instruments, then the notice of the proposal goes up on the registry, usually for um, a perfunctory 30-day comment period. Uh, comments get submitted to the government official uh, who then must consider the comments received. The uh, decision maker also has to consider the statement of environmental values for the ministry under the EBR. And then the ministry makes a decision. The decision goes back up on the environmental registry system that uh, Sawyer described. And that will trigger a very time limited appeal period uh, in which um, concerned citizens might think about seeking leave or permission of the tribunal to appeal the approval. Um, but the approval, the uh, leave test is very strict. Um, you have to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the tribunal that there's reason to believe that the issuance of the uh, instrument uh, is unreasonable in light of the applicable law and policy framework. You also have to demonstrate that the issuance of the instrument may cause significant environmental harm. So it's a pretty stringent test, uh, but it's not an impossible test to meet. And in a few moments, I'll, I'll give you a real life example where my clients were able to satisfy that uh, threshold. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> I think in light of the time, that's enough uh, legalese, that's enough legal theory. I'm going to turn now to uh, three actual examples where these kinds of public participation rights have been used by residents or groups to make a difference, uh, to safeguard uh, the environment in their local communities. And so this first example involves a large landfill that was proposed uh, north of uh, Napanee in particular, uh, there's a, a landfill that's been there since the late 1950s, and the proponent decided it was time to make a very large expansion of that existing site. That was subject to the individual EA process that I described a few moments ago, and I represented a citizens group um, who opposed the expansion, and uh, we worked pretty closely with the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinney in opposing this uh, proposed expansion. Uh, and so we participated in all stages of the EA process. That took a long time. It took uh, a lot of resources. It took a trip to uh, the Divisional Court and the Court of Appeal here in Ontario. Um, but ultimately, uh, we were able to persuade the Environment Minister to refuse to approve the expansion under the Environmental Assessment Act. So as you may suspect, that was cause for a, a big celebration uh, between my uh, clients and the Mohawks of Bay of Quinney. But I will say the um, celebration was short-lived because the proponent came back with uh, a renamed and rejigged proposal and a second environmental assessment process uh, was started. Uh, it's not over yet, so stay tuned for the outcome of that process. Um, next slide, please. So my second example involves the proposal to significantly expand an existing quarry near Arm Prior, and the proponent also wanted to uh, uh, build a permanent asphalt plant within the quarry. 
Um, that needed official plan amendments that needed rezoning. It also required uh, an approval under the Aggregate Resources Act. Um, I represented um, some folks who live near the site and uh, they're very concerned about uh, potential air pollution impacts in particular from the asphalt plant. Um, so there is an, an appeal hearing that was held under the Planning Act uh, and uh, my clients participated in that uh, proceeding, presented evidence and ultimately, the Ontario Municipal Board uh, rejected the asphalt plant and uh, allowed a, a, a downsized or downscaled expansion subject to binding conditions that were aimed at protecting the groundwater, protecting natural heritage features, et cetera. Um, we, also had, we also took a trip to Divisional Court on that one, um, but that's a story for another day. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so my final example, um, involves the Environmental Bill of Rights. Again, it's another long story, and I'll summarize it in about 60 seconds. Um, basically, a cement plant uh, wanted to uh, burn tires and plastics and other waste material at its uh, plant near Bath, Ontario. Um, in order to do that, in order to use those uh, types of alternative fuels, the uh, company had to apply for and receive uh, two approvals under the um, Environmental Protection Act. One was for air emissions, the other was for uh, waste disposal site. Um, so those are both uh, prescribed instruments. The proposals went up on the uh, registry for a 30 day comment period. My clients and others filed comments. Uh, the director decided to issue the two approvals anyways. Uh, we then sought and obtained leave to appeal both approvals. Um, the tribunal thought this was an appropriate case of grant leave to appeal. Um, that leave decision was then subject to judicial review by the company that wanted to set aside and quash the tribunal decision. Um, it also involved a motion to the Ontario Court of Appeal. We don't get into that. The bottom line is that the uh, uh, two approvals were eventually revoked uh, thanks to the availability of this uh, third, par third party appeal right under the EVR. Next slide, please. So in terms of lessons learned, this is what I've gleaned from the last uh, you know, 37 years of environmental law practice. Number one, if you're gonna um, participate in the approvals process, if you're going to uh, try to appeal an approval decision, these are the things you need to think about. Get informed, get involved, make alliances, there's strength in numbers. Um, make sure you comply with any prescribed deadlines. Uh, for the filing of com uh, comments. If you're gonna go the FOI route, do that early because it may take weeks, months, and sometimes years to get the requested records. Um, you can't you know, go into the administrative process uh, with just vague concerns or statements of concern. You need to get evidence. You need to get, you normally need to get um, qualified experts to prepare um, uh, expert reports or peer reviews of the proponents materials, et cetera and you provide that to the decision maker. Um, and, and keep in mind, these are legal processes. So you may wanna think about retaining a lawyer um, to be sure you can get through these processes without a lawyer, but if you wanna enhance your chances of success, you should think about a lawyer. Uh, and if you're thinking about experts or a lawyer, that means you need to uh, undertake a, an effective fundraising campaign. These, uh, these kinds of cases can be very pricey and they take a long time to uh, run through the mill. And finally, if you're not happy with the ultimate decision of the minister or the tribunal, there are opportunities to go to court. But again, you better lawyer up. This is not something you want to do on your own. The final slide, please. Uh, so this is a way to get in touch with us. If you're interested in obtaining uh, summary advice or applying for CELA services, I would suggest that you go to the uh, CELA.ca website. You go to the staff directory, you can find our phone numbers and email addresses there. With that, I'll stop and throw it back to you, April. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, yeah, I just put the email contact information in the chat box. So if anyone has questions about today's content um, that we don't get to or that you think of afterwards, you're welcome to email uh, myself. I should put mine in there as well. Um, but I did put in our general information email address, which is info at sila.ca. Or if you're interested in litigation or you were looking for legal advice, um, the summary advice that Rick referred to, you can email articling at sila.ca. That's going to go straight to Zoe uh, and she can reply. 
So as I'm just wrapping up with a couple of closing comments, um, I would just ask if anyone has a question, pop it into the chat box or you can raise your digital hand um, so that I know that and we might be able to stay on for a couple of extra minutes to answer those. But the closing things that I wanted to say are in regards to the toolkit that Sawyer presented, we're just in the final stages of producing that report. Um, we wanted to be able to incorporate any comments or feedback that we heard through today's webinar about local issues. What issues are important in your community? What threats are you aware of or have things gotten worse over the last several years that, that we should be aware of and making sure that we're including? Um, perhaps things you didn't hear today that you thought you might, um, let us know about that as well. So you'll see that report um, up on the CELA website in the next couple of weeks. It will go up on the Making the Links webpage, and I'll include that webpage in the email that I send you. Um, and when the report is actually published on that site, you'll get a second follow-up email from me. So you can expect two emails from me in the next week or two, or sorry, in the next few weeks. Um, and the other thing that I will mention is that we are looking, uh, now that we are through the worst of the pandemic and we can be starting to be doing in-person things again, we are open to coming into communities and doing some of these presentations in person. So if you're aware of an issue in your community or you have um, you know, grassroots groups that would benefit from a presentation from us, um, please let me know. You can in email me directly um, at april at sela.ca or you can use that general info at email address and we can talk about how to arrange for some in-person um, workshops or presentations. Um, so I don't see any digital hands and I haven't seen any questions pop into the chat, which just means that Sawyer and Rick answered all of your questions before you even got a chance to ask them. Um, so I'm going to wrap up at this point and just um, remind you that a lot of our contact information is on the screen here. Oh, hang on. I see something in the Q&A. Let me look before I wrap us up. Ah, okay. Um, I'm going to take this in just a moment when I um, end the, the webinar so that we don't um, get all of this on the recording. So I see the question in the q and I'm going to get to it in just a moment. Um, but I'm going to say thank you very much to Sawyer for all of their hard work on this toolkit and all the really excellent information that was presented today. And thank you to Rick um, for your presentation about public participation, both really, really valuable. And I'm going to pause the recording now.